All right, welcome to day three, Computer Science 45. Today we're going to be talking about uh, the first kinds of things related to let's move that video screen out of the way. Related to computer architecture. So computer architecture is the topic of understanding what your computer is doing behind the scenes, so to speak. We're used to, as computer science majors, treating the CPU as a black box or you know, we just compile something and magic happens and then we run the program and magic happens and then hello world appears on the screen. Okay. Uh, in this class, like I said on the first day, you're going to be kind of opening that black box up and, and looking inside. And so we're going to be uh, starting off today with um, talking about binary and uh, representations of uh, numbers in the simplest possible format. We're going to be talking about two's complement. Uh, maybe today, but maybe in the future as well. And um, and then we're probably gonna I'm, I'm probably gonna switch about halfway through this lecture to um, back to assembly, so you guys can do your next homework assignment, and I'll explain more on how to do if statements, if else statements, for loops, while loops, all that kind of stuff in assembly. Okay, right. so let's get going. In assembly. Um, you know, basically CPUs only process binary, right? And all, all an assembly program really is, like if I, uh, if I go over to the thing here and I, uh, uh, let's say I look at some assembly code and there's like all this stuff, you know, it looks really complicated. That's still for humans, right? That's still for humans, even though it looks like, uh, you know, the language of the gods right there. It's not, CPUs still can't understand this because this is text. Okay, so there, there is a part of the GNU compiler suite called the assembler. And um, when, you, when you type gcc main.c, there's a number of steps that take place. Uh, that it does lex tokenizing and lexing and parsing and like there's all these steps and there's an optimizer in the middle there and it generates in clang it generates an intermediate representation there's all these steps that takes place that we'll study later that doesn't really matter right now but the final output of the compiler phase is assembly then there's something called the assembler and the assembler compi you know compiles but it's not really compiling it's assembling is the word it assembles this text file here into something the CPU can actually understand. And so what the CPU can actually understand is zeros and ones. And so if you um, gcc float.s, uh, junk at end of line, I don't know, it's very different assembly thing, junk at end of line, hmm. loop.s, what the hell is going on here? Hmm. All right, let's just assemble it, maybe. We have start at s, then main dot c. There we go. There's. Why is this not syntax highlighted? Did something break? I updated the pi. See how there's no syntax highlighting on this. Okay. And Vim syntax is working. Okay. GCC makes an assembly for me main.c. GCC main.s. And that worked. Yeah, okay, cool. Uh, so this is what the assembly code looks like, right? It's uh, going to load the memory address of hello world somewhere and it's going to put it onto the, uh, into R0 at some point, or there it is. It loads the address of um, hello world and calls the phone. Okay, so what happens when you gcc main.s is that it translates that assembly code into zeros and ones. What actually happens is uh, main dot, uh, let's do this. Okay, this is what actually your program looks like. And this is in octal. And I could, I could dump this in binary, it would just be a little bit bigger. But this is, this is what your CPU actually sees. And this is completely uh, unuseful for uh, us humans, right? Like, you know, if you really get into it and you understand, you know, what's going on here, um, 
you could read this probably and you could very slowly and laboriously decompile it you could take this and decompile it back into assembly and there's but you don't need to do that because there's tools for that so there are tools like uh, the gdb the gnu debugger can reverse engineer your program back into assembly okay it won't have labels and things like that necessarily but because uh, all that gets stripped out but this is what a program is okay uh, the left hand side here is a memory address do you guys see that the left hand side is a memory address it shows you where you are in the program and then um, this is your actual program in octal which is a different format uh, why does it default to octal because the tool that i use is called octal dump od um, dump files in octal and other formats so it's the it default to octal Octal is probably the least useful of the common formats. Uh, let's see, is there a binary format? And octal bytes, where are you in binary? <sighs> the point is, like, I'm not. I'm not really interested in explaining this. This is the same thing in uh, hex. So, does that help? Like, well, yeah. Can you, does that can you read that better? Because it's in hex now instead of octal. It, yeah. It doesn't matter. And and the point is, you're not really supposed to read it. This is what the CPU actually processes. The CPU will process 32 bits at a time. So each one of these um, four letters you see here is four bits. So what I have selected there is 16 bits. And so what the CPU reads is 32 bits at a time. It's a 32-bit system. It reads 32 bits at a time. And then the CPU has a sort of uh, hardware if statement inside of it saying, all right, well, if the command is uh, branch, then do this. And if the command is multiply, and I don't know if 0F14 is multiply. I legit don't know because it doesn't matter because I write in human languages like assembly. you know. So maybe that means multiply R1 and R0. I don't know, right? You know, all these things could mean add or subtract like I, I legitimately don't know because I don't care because it doesn't matter it doesn't impact my life at all and you just see colors rip the man Alan Turing yeah what did you type for that screen with all the info oh man yeah that's that's something that uh, everyone needs to know so there's a command called man and man is your help page and so you guys are gonna be doing a lot of stuff on Unix this semester and uh, Unix has a built-in help um, system, I guess I'd call it, called man. Doesn't have anything to do with man versus women uh, or any of that stuff. It is the man page, manual page. So if you man octal dump, you can read the um, how octal dump works. If you man hex, was it hex dump? Then you can see how to output something in hex. If you want to learn about NM, which is which shows you the names inside of a um, a file, that's why it's called NM name. Uh, that will um, that's a little bit more useful than those other two. Trust me, the other two um, you're not going to need in this class. You'll, you you might need them if you ever take the class, rebuild your own CPU, and you actually need to dump you know the thing and make sure that you know. Because you're making, you're, you know, a lot of times you're making the assembler, right? And so you need to look at that, look at them in those circumstances. But this one's a little bit more useful. So if I type uh, nm a dot out, then uh, you can see all the different function calls and, and sections and things like that inside of the code and what memory offset they're in, which again doesn't really matter to you. Uh, but right here, uh, you can see that it has a call to put s. And if you're like, what is put s? You can say man put s. And you can say, oh, that's part of the C standard IO library. Yep. And what's what's interesting about this is that put s is not actually in your program. Your, your program is calling a function not inside of itself. And so when I told you that the, uh, the linker pulls all of the undefined references together. That's only for, um, there's a whole lecture on that, but it's only for things that, what's, what's the shortest way of putting this? 
Uh, it's it's the only way of uh, only for functions that you're supposed to provide, I guess. If there's a function in the standard library, then uh, there's something called dynamic linking, and it will leave it undefined. But it kind of mentions you can see right here. Hey, by the way, this is in the uh, GNU C library. Okay, so the GNU C library version 2.4 has this function, and so when you when you type a dot out, it will resolve this symbol. There's there's something called a dynamic library. Um, locate glib C. Uh, and so you can see that there is man pages for it. Where are you? Uh, Things super laggy right now. Okay, Libsy, yeah, there's going to be a lot of these. That's why I was hoping not to do that. Uh, pipe through grep .so. So if you ever get too much output like that, you can pipe the result through grep. Grep will search for certain keywords. So I'm going to grep for .so, and I probably need uh, to be a little bit more specific than that. But you can see, OK, right here. So this is Clang's C library, which is different from ours. It should be under GNU, maybe. Yeah, maybe that one. I don't know. So I would have to scroll through here. Um, Lib Clang, yeah. Lib C, I just want, yeah, whatever. Um, the point is, is that these functions live elsewhere. Okay. So, the, and then the nm command can tell you which functions are defined inside of your program, which functions are, are outside of it. Okay. Uh, it's all sort of historical curiosity right now. We're gonna have a whole lecture on that whole system later. So, uh, yeah, Mamet seeing, uh, uh, cheating with the answer here. He's uh, he's giving homework answers. There you go. There's that's how you program in assembly. <laughs> right there. <laughs> so uh, binary to text converter. Nice. Okay. So 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 let's go back to our lecture. So what happens um, when the, the CPU is reading those chunks of 32 bits at a time is the CPU kind of splits it into different sections. And so uh, let's go back into full screen mode. Um, there we go. And so the CPU looks at the first four bits and that's the um, condition, which I believe is the, um, where you can do like the GT or the LE. Remember how we talked about that last time? You can have conditional uh, operations. So you can do a move only if the result of the previous comparison was greater than. Or you can do a add only if the result of the previous comparison was not equals. And so that's those four bits hold greater than, less than, less than or equal to, not equal to, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. These three bits are always 0, zero 1. The opcode, notice there's only four, there's only four bits for the opcode. The opcode is the command. So that means this CPU only holds uh, it, I, and I should mention there's other formats for the instructions, so there's actually more than this. But uh, let's say this is the only let's say that this is the only format they have for assembly instructions. How many different commands would there be in assembly if this was if you have four four bits? So if there are four bits, and the opcode is means something like add, subtract, multiply, branch, compare. How many different commands would be possible if this was the only instruction format they had in ARM? This is on Canvas, right? Yeah, it's on Canvas. The answer is 16. The answer is 16, because four bits, uh, two, four, eight, 16. Okay, zero, 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 one, zero, zero, one, zero, 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 one, one, zero, one, zero, 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 one, zero, one, zero, one, one, zero, zero, one, 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 zero, 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 one, zero, zero, one, one, zero, one, zero, one, zero, one, 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 zero, zero, one, one, zero, one, 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 zero, one, 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 one. There you go, all 16. And so, and so the CPU is literally parsing bits and, um, you know, there are jokes about like people, you know, writing programs in binary and, and they've probably done it. There's a lot of uh, way more hardcore computer scientists than me out there. Um, like I have, I have no interest in getting a magnetic needle and 
manually adjusting bits on a hard drive platter to pro no like you know no not not interested in that at all you know give me give me higherly higher level languages okay so uh so this is how binary works okay with binary there's only zeros and ones and every time you add one to a number you, it just adds a one in the last digit and if you get two ones you carry the one okay so it's just like in um it's just like with decimal numbers it's my mouse here we go it's like with uh, decimal numbers let's say we had 123 plus 77 you go 3 plus 7 is 10, carry the 1. 1 plus 2 plus 7 is 10, carry the 1. 1 plus 1 is 2, right? With binary, if you have 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, and you add uh, 1,001 to it, or 1, 0, 0, 1, I should say, that's the number 9. This is 9. Okay. And that's 3 plus 8 is 11 plus 16 is 27. So to add binary, you just one plus one is 10, or one zero. One plus one is 10, carry the one. One plus zero plus zero is one. One plus one is 10. One plus one is 10. And then we end up getting, uh, that's, what do these digits correspond to? Remember, this is the ones digit, the twos digit, the fours digit, the eights digit, 16s digit, and the 32s digit. Okay. So this is 32. That's the 32-bit, that's the 4-bit, 32 plus 4 is 36. So you can see that 27 plus 9 is 36. So 9 is 8 plus 1, 27 is 16 plus 8 plus 2 plus 1. And so it's just like with decimal. In decimal, if you have 123, that's the hundreds digit, right? That's the tens digit, that's the ones digit. It's just like that, except instead of being powers of 10, that's why, it's, that's why decimal, deci, 10, base 10. In, in decimal, every digit corresponds to a one greater power of 10. Ones digit, tens digit, hundreds digit, thousands digit, ten thousands digit. In binary, each, it's base two. Binary, by, mean, by meaning two. Every digit corresponds to a subsequently greater power of two. So the rightmost one is the ones digit, the next one is the twos digit, the next one's the fours digit, the next one's the eights digit. Yep. So... Do you guys uh, do you guys kind of understand the basics and, and we're gonna we're gonna learn more about um, two's complement and um, how to do fractions in binary later I just want you guys kind of understanding the the most basic of basics with with binary so So that's that's binary. Okay, the each each digit corresponds to a power of two, and you just add the things together. And if you want to convert like forty-two into binary, if you want to convert that into binary, then there's a really easy process for doing so. What is the greatest power of two smaller than forty-two? What is the greatest power of two that is smaller than forty-two? Right, 32, okay? So the greatest power of two smaller than 42 is one. So I put a one in the 32's digit, subtract it out, I get 10. What is the greatest power of two smaller than 10? Eight, very good. So there, there's no, there's a zero in the 16's digit, there's a one in the eight's digit. Subtract eight out from it here, I end up with two. What is the greatest power of two less than or equal to two? Should be saying less than or equal to two, right? So there's a zero in the fours digit, there's a one in the twos digit, we subtract it out, we get zero, and so there's a zero remaining. And so 42 in binary is lol lol lol, basically. It's 101010. It's kind of fun. Okay, 42 is of course the most important number in computer science. It's the answer to life, the universe, and everything. So uh, yeah, so 42 in binary is lol lol lol. And you'll you'll be getting uh, Zy books on on this. You can you can practice them and things like that. Clear the annotations. Discard there. Yeah. Okay. So 
Opcodes. 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 Opcodes are the hardware version of, um, like, uh, a command. Right? So, like, in, in C++, you say x is equal to x plus 3. That's an add command. And so what happens, what the assembler does is it has a table of all the different commands and it says, okay, well, add is 1010 zero, zero, or something like that. And so when it's, when it's putting these binary things together, like we saw that garbage, uh, you know, thing over here, you know, like this may, might be a program, who knows? And so the opcode for add might be 0111. One, one. So that would mean add. And then this might mean, uh, what would that be? Nine, register nine. So the first four bits might be add. The next one might be register nine, and then add register nine to register, what is that, uh, one, two, six, you know, something like that. And so um, that's actually what the CPU processes. And that wasn't a real analysis, I'm just, I'm just telling you. But that's what the CPU does. The CPU reads 32 bits at a time from your program, and part of that is the opcode. The opcode means do an addition, do a multiply, do a subtract. And the other bits mean from register one, from register two, uh, left shifted three times. And there's a format for that, which I just, I'll just show you again. And so the opcode would be add, uh, add, uh, I'll talk about what the S means in a second, add register three, register four, and then this is the flexible second parameter, right? You know I, how I told you guys there's a flexible second parameter. You notice how there's only four, four bits for the registers? That's because there's 16 registers, right? There's 16 registers, so four bits. 2, 4, 8, 16, right? The flexible second parameter has more bits allocated to it. That's how it can handle both registers and numbers and shifting and things like that. It actually allocates, uh, was that 12 bits instead of four. And so it can handle eight bit numbers. It can handle um, shifting. It can handle um, um, registers, so. and. And technically, they're not eight, the constants you put in there. Like when you add R0, R0, 1, um, I tell you that's an 8-bit number. Technically, it's a little bit more complicated than that. It can be a lit, an 8-bit number left shifted um, as well, which starts getting really complicated as to what numbers you can put in there, what numbers you can't. And so just basically just think of it as an 8-bit number for simplicity, and you'll be fine. You usually don't need to add, you know, 9,027 to something, you know. Um, if you do need to do that, just move it into a register, then add it. Okay. All right. So, um, okay. So let's talk about architecture. So d does that, d does this make sense to you guys though? Like this is actually, and you don't, you don't need to, uh, you can pull up the reference for this, but I, I wouldn't, you don't need to know it. The assembler does this for you. The assembler translates your command, add R0, R0, 7. It translates that into ones and zeros in this format and it puts it into the eight out out that's all an eight out of that's all eight out out is it's just 32 of these at a time 32 bits 32 bits 32 bits and so if you want to decipher somebody else's program you can decompile it and we'll do a we'll do a uh, discard this event discard what's going on here okay. and so you know, we'll we'll do we'll do an exercise at some point where you have to uh, decompile um, programs and you know look at you know I'll I'll give you an eight out out and you have to decompile it into assembly and then edit it to remove copy protection. Let's say uh, what a file extension would you use to write binary code? I don't know, dude. Dot uh, O, I guess. Um, I I don't edit I don't edit binary files like it's not it's not my jam, dude. Um, the only time I did it was when I was making a CPU and we had to make literally zeros and one programs. And then I used, uh, what did I use? Hex edit, I think. Is that a thing? Yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, that's not something that like people do. That's why assemblers exist. The only people that really need to know this are the people who write the assemblers, right? So the people that write an assembler have a reference guide. And writing assemblers is actually pretty easy. I was traveling on a train on the East Coast and I met a guy who wrote the assembler for uh, one of the original IBM mainframes. 
I was like, oh, dude, that's an amazing achievement. That's really cool. He's like, no, it was really easy. Um, I'm like, really? He's like, yeah, like there's just, there's a format of the bits and all you do is say, all right, if the command is add, write to the file 1011, whatever the, whatever the opcode is for it. And if it's register zero, write zero, 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 zero. If the register is five, write zero, one, zero, one. You know, he's like, there's just a table and all you have to really under, understand is like, um, the table, you know, it's like, what is, what are the things mean? And then he's like, I, I wrote it in like a couple hours, you know, or, you know, it was in a couple hours. I think he said it was like uh, eight hours. It was like one day for him to write it. And that was it. And, and, it, and it was just because there's a lot of options. And the original, the original IBM mainframes had a uh, pretty crazy format. It wasn't like this. They had variable length instructions. And so you could have an instruction that was like this big, or you could have an instruction that was that big. And, uh, and that was because that they were not reading from hard drives. They were usually reading from magnetic tape. And so they would have a, a head and the tape would run past. And so it, it was beneficial for them to have really long instructions sometimes because the thing could just sit there and spin and it would just keep reading until, you know. And so that was really cool. But he was like, yeah, it was, it was not really, it was, it was like, it wasn't really hard. I just, I had a book, I had the, you know, I had the reference manual and I just took the reference manual and and implemented, you know, the, the table. This becomes this, this becomes this. If this, then this, if this, then this, that was it. It's not hard. So, sounds like a fun job, yeah. I mean, uh, computer science is a little bit different back in the 70s, right? And you guys are maybe getting a little bit of a glimpse of it, right, with, you know, this kind of binary stuff. It's a little bit different. Nowadays, we write in like Python and JavaScript and stuff like that, and there's nothing wrong with it. And there's a reason why people write in Python and JavaScript. Is because nobody wants to get a magnetic needle out and sit there and edit the ones and zeros on a hard drive. Um, people making the manual went crazy. No, the people who made the manual were computer architects. And so they basically sat down, you know, they would have a committee and they would design the assembly language for a machine. And the trouble was, is like all these different machines had different assembly languages. And that's why C and other high level languages came about was because nobody, like every time the architecture changed, the assembly would change and then you'd have to redo your program, right? And that's annoying. And so the whole point of C and other high level languages is that you write hello world. And then if the architecture changes, if the architecture changes out from underneath you, all you have to do is have the assembler change. And so all the, and that, and the assembler is very easy to write. Like my uh, acquaintance uh, on the train told me, it's very easy to write, you know, it just translates from a table into a thing and um and so basically uh oh there's a code emission stuff that has to change also but whatever the uh the point is is that um your your c program can can change the same it can stay the same and then sort of the underlying mechanism and when you go gcc something like part of that will the compiler will change but your code doesn't change do you guys understand so rather than having to rewrite thousands and thousands of programs every time you upgrade your computer Rather than having to change thousands of programs, you have to change one. And so you have to change one, you have to change the compiler suite, basically. And once the compiler suite updates the new platform, you can take all of your old code and recompile it for the new code, and everything works. And that's really nice. That's why computer science is the way that it is. Right. Okay. So, um, Python U. That's funny. Uh, nothing wrong with Python. It's... It's a, it's a, it's a good language for beginners. It really is. Okay. So, um, so let's talk about architecture. Okay. So you got a mouse, you got a keyboard, you got a monitor. Uh, I've, I've been to a lot of, um, schools. I used to do educational research. And so I've traveled to a lot of schools, spent a lot of times in libraries, watching people teach at different places all over the country. And I've seen these kinds of posters, right? These posters where it says like, the hard drive of a computer holds the program and data and RAM, which is really fast, holds the program and data in it instead of on hard drive because hard drives are really slow. And, and the CPU is the thing that does stuff and the mouse and keyboard are input and a monitor displays output, you know. Um, occasionally you, you'd have a teacher that would point to the box and say, that's the CPU, which of course is ridiculous. So here you go. Here's, here's an example of a Here's an example of a uh, middle school computer architecture poster, right? 
And so I would love to learn to solder. We're supposed to learn to solder in this class. I don't know if that's going to happen. I don't know if it's going to happen. I'm sorry. Uh, it, normally my rule is like everybody comes out of this class knowing how to, how to, how to solder, but, uh, coronavirus, man. I don't know. I don't know what to tell you. So, if you don't download your RAM, I don't know what you're doing. Okay. So here we go. So we got the monitor here. This is a very advanced lecture right there. <clears throat> Fourth semester computer science in college. You're learning what a printer is, huh? Never shown this to you guys before. It's all new, right? Am I blowing any minds here? So these are called discs. <laughs> discs. We don't. Call, nobody ever called them discs, even in the eighties, which is what it looks like this came from. They're floppies. Keyboard, mouse, mouse pad. That's very important. You have to know what the mouse pad is, or you can't use the CPU. Disk drive, CD-ROM drive, central processing unit is of course the entire case. There you go. There's the CPU. It's the entire case, the central processing unit. And uh, if you guys look at the um, the description down here, you can see that uh, a monitor displays information. A mouse is a handheld tool to point to, draw, and select items on the screen. The CPU, the CPU is the main area where information is stored. <laughs> so, if, <laughs> there you go. The CPU is the main area where information is stored. <coughs> mm, yeah. Mm. <sighs> and in case you're missing the joke, um, that's not what a CPU is. The CPU is not the main area for information storage, right? The CPU is the brain of the computer. Okay. Uh, technically at runtime, yeah, it's not the main area where information is stored though. It's the hard drive is the main area where information is stored. Okay. Um, but you know, this is wrong. Okay. Yeah. The, that's the CPU right there, the printer. <laughs> okay. So th that's basically wrong. You know, there's a lot of things wrong on that. Um, that poster, uh, but it's funny, which is why I put it on there. The, the The reality of the situation is that memory is actually very slow. RAM is actually very slow. Um, you could do, it, it depends on the architecture, but as a general rule of thumb, in the amount of time that it takes you to load one number out of RAM, you could do 80, 90 different ads. So imagine, uh, you know, doing that assignment we just did there, and having an 80 stroke penalty every time you had to touch RAM, right? That's slow. That's slow. Every time you had to read to RAM, eat, read from RAM, it's slow, very slow. So, um, so yeah, the, the, the reality of the situation is you actually don't want to touch RAM or, or as little as possible. You have to, you're going to, but you, you know, what you want to do is have the hard drive load everything that's needed into RAM. And then when you're doing something, you load stuff from RAM into the registers of the CPU. And you do all your work on the registers. The registers have no penalty for accessing them. It's for free. Reading and writing to registers is free, part of an instruction. Reading and writing to RAM, though, um, yeah, yeah, uh, not, well, writing's fast, because you can just say, write this, and then you don't have to worry about it finishing. But reading from RAM is uh, 200 editions, I see here. Like I said, it depends on the architecture how bad that penalty is. It depends on how fast your RAM is. It's one of the reasons why I like buying fast RAM. Um, because every time you have to do a read, there's a penalty. And so the faster your RAM is, the less the penalty. So if, if all the stuff you did was like adding things in RAM together, it would be like, your, your CPU would run at like 5% the performance. Okay. So, or not, not even 5% was that. Uh, one over 200. It, it depends again on the architecture, but like, like negligible speed, like one fiftieth or one or 0.05, percent of the performance. Okay. So do you guys all understand? RAM is slow. Contrary to, contrary to popular belief, RAM is not fast compared to the CPU. And so 
uh, early CPUs allowed you to do things directly on RAM. For example, uh, Motorola 68K, which is what I learned assembly on, you could uh, say add the value in RAM here to the, to the value in RAM here, and it would do it. Okay. Um, but because RAM is so slow, that's actually very inefficient. And so a lot of modern architectures only allow you to work on things in registers. And so if you want to do something in a register, you have to load the values from RAM, and then you sit there and you do your adds, your multiplies, and your all the stuff together. And then when you're done with when you're done with all that algebra, then you write it back into RAM. So this is something called a load store architecture. A load store architecture. Uh, yeah, you should still be able to input your your stroke count on campus. It'll be marked as late, but I've already graded the assignment, so I, you know. Check out this bad boy: twelve megs of RAM, five hundred mg hard drive, mg. Built-in spreadsheet capabilities and modem that transmits at over 28,000 bits per second. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's, it's really funny when you look at old old TV shows. So, um, yeah, so it's a load store architecture. ARM is a load store architecture. You can't do addition on things in RAM. If you want to do addition on things in RAM, you have to load it into a register, add them together, and then store it back. And the reason for that is because they don't want you, because, I mean, if you're just doing one addition, then, yeah, it's probably faster to just add things in RAM together. But in, in reality, you do lots of adds and comparisons and things like that. And so ARM only allows you to do operations on registers. The only thing, the only thing you can do with RAM is to load from it and to store from it. That's basically it. Okay, and so because RAM is slow, there's something called caching. So if you ever go into Best Buy, you'll see it's got four megabytes of L2 cache. What the hell does that mean? Well, uh, maybe we'll maybe we'll do an exercise with caching um, next time. I, I do kind of want to get to uh, to the assembly side of things, but basically, um, there's most recently used. There's also uh, there's other ways of doing it as well, but um, the what a cache is, is it, it writes like a, like if you're going to be using something a lot, you, you typically write it down, right? Like if you're going to be, uh, if you're going to be, um, uh, if you have to like enter, enter your password into a bunch of sites, you like write it down somewhere or you, you have your browser's password manager write it down for you. And so the next time you see the password site, it pulls it out of this cache and it, and it gives it to you. So what a cache is, it's a, it's a much smaller than RAM. Uh, caches, um, L1 caches, which are the fastest, are like on the order of like hundreds of K. Like they're very small. But there's a very small penalty for accessing L1 cache. <clears throat> um, caching is a form of memory hierarchy talked about in chapter one, yes. And so you've got your registers, and then the registers kind of talk to L1 cache. And so L1 cache feeds data into the registers very quickly and registers can be written to L1 cache very quickly, like on the order of like a four cycle penalty instead of an 80 or a 200 cycle penalty. And then when things get kicked out of L1 cache, because it's very small, when it fills up, when it fills up, the CPU uh, knocks things out based on different schemes, and you'll learn more about those schemes later. But let's just say when it gets full, it just discards the least recently used thing as an inaccurate oversimplification. Um, then it gets kicked out into L2 cache. And L2 cache has, actually has a copy of everything in L1 cache. L2 cache, let's say it has a 20 cycle penalty. So if you if you have to do a read for memory and it's not an L1 cache because it got evicted, uh, but it's an L2 cache and your CPU will sit there and wait for 20 cycles. You could have done 20 additions before the data is available. And then uh, a lot of systems have L3 caches. I don't believe the Raspberry Pi is, I believe they only have L1 and L2. L3 cache is oftentimes used to share uh, caching between different cores on a CPU, uh, but it could be quite big. It could be like 20 megs or something like that. Um, the, uh, let's see, let's see if it'll list it on, on my CPU. And there's no, there's no hard and fast rule for how big these things are or how they're designed, what system they use for evicting things, uh, because these are all architectural decisions that get made, you know, all the time by computer engineers. Okay, so my L1 data cache is 32 kilobytes, and I've got 10 of those because i got 10 cores, right? 
So my, uh, and so the L1 cache is split into data and instructions. Okay. So instructions are your commands, add, subtract, multiply, branch, compare. And so it keeps track of basically the last 32, let's see, to be 32 kilobytes. Uh, then let's see, and there's 32 bits would be, uh, what's that? 32 kilobytes times eight. Uh, so 8,000, like your last 8,000 instructions, something like that, if I'm doing the math right. I haven't had enough coffee yet, I'm not sure that's correct, but on that order, you know, it'll keep track of like your last 8,000 instructions. So if you do a branch backwards, um, it'll be able to pull and you know, like you, you, you know, you're going through your program, you do a branch backwards for a loop, hey, it's still in cache, right? And so 8,000 instructions is pretty good. But like most of the hot loops of your computer that you're gonna be running over and over again will easily fit into L1 cache. And then the other uh, thing it has is 32 kilo kilobytes of uh, data. And so whatever variables, if you got X and Y and Z and C++, they're probably all gonna be held in the data cache. And so it will be very quick to access the L1 data cache. And um, the reason why they're split is because you don't want, you don't want your uh, X and Y to be kicking out instructions, right? If you have to branch backwards and that thing's been kicked out by a variable, then you're gonna have a big penalty because you have to go to L2 cache instead. Okay, so my L2 cache is one megabyte in size and I've got 10 of them. So every core has its own L1 cache, its own L2 cache. And so uh, this is eight way set associative, 16 way set associative. Uh, you'll learn what those mean, not in this class probably, maybe in this class, but that's more of a junior level architecture class. Um, and then level three is a shared cache between all the cores. So if, if two cores are reading and writing to the same memory, which happens all the time when you're doing multi-threading, then this cache here will allow them to share data without having to go all the way up to RAM. And so my L3 cache is about 14 megabytes. It's pretty nice. Xeons, uh, the, the big server CPUs, will sometimes have much larger L3 caches. So, uh, 64,000 instructions per core, probably. Yeah, yeah. 32 kilobytes times eight bytes per bit divided by four bits per instruction. No, the instructions are 32 bits. The instructions are 32 bits because the instruction is that whole thing. And actually this is a 64 bit system. So divide by 64, which is uh, 16, uh, 4,000, yeah. So if it's a 32 bit system, yeah, I think I did the math right. Um, if it's a 32 bit system, you'll have 8,000 instructions on a 64. On a 64 bit system, you can only fit 4,000 instructions in RAM. And that's assuming that Intel CPUs have fixed instruction sizes, which they don't. Um, uh, Intel has variable length instructions, and so it's more complicated than ARM. Um, anyhow, but that there is one important thing about that, which is, did you guys hear what I said? A 32-bit system can hold 8,000 instructions in cache. A 64-bit system can only hold half that, 4,000 instructions in cache. So the cache is effectively twice as big if you're running in 32-bit mode. Why though? Because 32 bits of memory on a 32-bit system. Every instruction is 32 bits long on ARM 32. For Intel, they have variable length instructions, which makes everything more complicated. Um, x86. So if, if an add instruction on ARM is 32 bits, ARM 32 is 32 bits, and that same instruction is 64 bits on an ARM ARCH64, then it takes up twice as much RAM in cache, right? In, in, in RAM as well. And so you can only fit half as many instructions into cache. That's one of the reasons why 64 bits isn't necessarily better than 32 bits, and it's, it, it isn't necessarily faster than 32 bits, because 30, you can pack more 32-bit instructions into a cache. And so, the odds are you're gonna get more cache misses if you have a 64-bit system than if you have a 32-bit system. And ARM even allows you to run in 16-bit mode. So if you don't need all these fancy 32-bit things, you can actually run your, uh, your the same program, actually. You don't even have to reboot your system or anything. Uh, when you're writing your assembly, you can actually write your assembly in 16-bit mode. It's called thumb, because it's less than an arm, right? Thumb, thumb. And you can actually write 16-bit commands. And the 16-bit commands can fit even more tightly into cache. And so um, you can oftentimes get a performance increase 
by moving from 32-bit mode into 16-bit mode. Not always, right? If you're doing a lot of 32-bit addition um, and things like, you know, if you need the 32 bits, then you need 32 bits. And 16-bit mode emulating 32-bit mode is slow, and 32-bit mode emulating 64-bit mode is slow, and, and so you, it, there's not, like, one right answer. Um, do you have a wider, better instruction set with 64? Of course, yeah. Your, your bit budget for... Your bit budget for um, 64 bits is way more expansive. You can have a lot more registers, right? In 64-bit mode, you're not limited to 16 registers. You can have a lot of registers, and so that can give you a performance increase because you got more registers to play with before you have to start kicking things out into into cache and and, and into RAM. And so there's no there's no like one right answer as to what's what's better, right? But there's a reason why we haven't like moved to 128-bit systems or 256-bit systems. Itanium was a 256-bit system, sort of. Um, I don't know if you guys remember Itanium. It was Intel's attempt to break away from its x86 legacy about 20 years ago. And it was a 256-bit system, I believe. Um, and nobody bought it because the only reason people buy Intel chips is because of the backwards compatibility. Um, it was a partnership with HP and uh, launched, yeah, 20 years ago. Yeah. Uh, it was fourth most deployed microprocessor for enterprise, and it was discontinued in the future? They were using past tense there, but I'm pretty sure July 2021 is in a few months. Okay. So, um, It, uh, um, I don't think the size of the change, I didn't, I don't think the size of the cache changes, just the size of the instruction, right? The cache is the same size, but if your instructions are smaller, you can fit more of them into the same storage area, right? So, um, right, like, does that make sense? Like, if you're using 64-bit instructions, they take up more RAM, and so you can pack less of them into the same size cache. So, um... Uh, run 32-bit on 64-bit, would there be a performance increase? There could be. That's why I said there's no right answer in terms of performance. Like, you, you know, it, it depends. <laughs> You'll hear me say that a lot. And, and, and a lot of experienced people will say, well, it depends. Benchmark it. Right? And, and that's what a lot of computer science comes down to is if, if, you're, if you have a suspicion, if you have a suspicion that you could get a performance increase by running it in 16-bit mode, run it in, you know, run in 16-bit mode. See if it runs faster. Um, maybe you know. Maybe you need the extra registers in 64-bit mode. Maybe you don't. I don't know. And it, it becomes a very complicated question that can be answered very simply. You run it. <laughs> you run it in 16 bits, 32 bits, 64 bits, and see which one's faster. And you don't even have to pick for the whole program, right? You can have certain functions be in thumb, and the rest of it be in 32-bit mode. So you can actually have mixed mode computing. In 32 bits and so you can have some of your functions in 16 bit some in 32 bit and um, yeah it's pretty cool 32 bit more efficient cache storage 64 bit more caches no 64 bit computers don't necessarily have more cache size um, 64 bit uh, uh, 64 bit architectures have more registers among other things so 64 bit architectures have because they can allocate more bits you see how there's a limit there's a limit here of 32 bits, right? And so they have to sit there and think very carefully about what those bits are going to be used for, you know? And so on a 64-bit system, you've got 32 extra bits, so you can add more bits for choosing registers. So you can have many more registers, which prevents you from running out of registers, like happens in ARM32 sometimes. Okay. Um, all right. Yeah, we'll skip that, because I want to I get to... I want to get to um, actually coding a little bit for you guys. So, does that that kind of make sense for you guys? Like L1 cache is fast, and if you if you get like just to come up with a random rule of thumb, uh, maybe L1 cache takes four cycles to hit, L2 cache takes twenty cycles to hit, L3 cache takes eighty, a hundred cycles to hit, um, RAM takes two hundred. Again, all these things depend, but like if if that'll just kind of give you a 
really rough ballpark idea um, of how things work. And so when a cache fills up, then the things will be in the next cache. Again, that's a very crude simplification, but that'll kind of get you there. Okay. Uh, what is that eight-way? So uh, this is called eight-way set associativity. And what it means is that when two... So caches are hash tables, okay? And what, what they hash is the memory address of the variable. So if you're reading and writing to X and X is at memory address one, two, three, four, then it will take memory address one, two, three, four and modulus it by the size of the cache. And that's the spot in the cache it goes into. And so eight way set associative means there are eight different things that can hash to the same spot before it starts kicking things out. Because if it's direct, if, if it's one way set associative, i.e. direct mapped, then if you have two registers that just happen to hash to the same cache line, they'll knock each other out every time. So what happens instead is you can have eight guys who hash to the same bucket, and when it gets filled up and a ninth guy comes in, then the least recently used, or the least often used, depending on your policy, kicks out the least recently used, let's say, and that goes into level two cache, even though it's there already. So it uses hash buckets. Uh, yeah, it uses, uh, it use, no, it's how many buckets it has is uh, based on the size of the cache, right? So you can divide you can divide this by uh, the size of your variables, and then you divide it by eight because each bucket is basically eight wide. And then uh, yeah, the size of the bucket is eight. Yeah, each bucket can hold eight integers. Yeah, exactly. And so when a ninth integer comes into that bucket, then it kicks out the least recently used, or the least often used, whichever system you're using. And uh, and then that gets kicked out into the level two cache. You can think of it that way. So he gets evicted from the, the cool kids club in L1 and he goes to L2 and then the L2 cache is much bigger. It can hold a lot more variables and it's 16 way set associative. So each bucket there holds 16 variables. And then if uh, he gets, he, you know, that variable hasn't come up in a while and other things have been hashing to it, then he could get evicted back into L3 cache. L3 cache is gigantic, 11 way set associative, Per, so every bucket has 11, which is a weird number, but whatever. Um, and then uh, and then if he gets evicted out of that, he's back in RAM. And you can't get evicted from RAM until you learn about virtual memory and paging with hard drives and things like that. Okay. So there's this whole memory hierarchy, which goes register. Registers are fast, no penalty. Level 1 cache, 4 cycle penalty to access memory there. Level 2 cache, 20 cycle penalty to access memory there. Level three cache, and each one is bigger and bigger and bigger. L3 cache, 100 cycle penalty. RAM, 200 cycle penalty. I've got 32 gigs of RAM on this machine. It can hold probably my entire program in RAM, but if I run out of RAM, then uh, it can go back to the hard drive. And so my hard drives, I've got terabytes of hard drive space. Uh, and hard drives are really, really slow. And SSDs are like not very fast compared to, you know, registers and cache as well. They're, they're fast. SSDs are fast, um, but they're not fast. Yeah, they're not register fast. What serves as the key of the hash table? The key is the memory address. The key is the memory address. We'll, we'll, we'll do that next time. We'll do a little exercise where you, know, you, you guys will actually learn um, how the stuff works. But I, I want to get into assembly because you're getting a new homework assignment today and, and you need to know the assembly to, to do it. <laughs> All right. Is that fair? So we'll we'll do we'll do we'll do the hashing we'll we'll do all that on Thursday. Okay. The memory address is both the key and the value. The memory address is the key, and the value is the data held at that memory address. So if at, at if at memory address one two three four it holds the value of forty two, then it hashes into the bucket based on one two three four, and the um, it, it it's got. It, it knows what memory address it is also, but it also has the, the value of it in the, in the, in the cache. And, uh, and eventually the variable is discarded back into RAM. You can think of it that way. It, it's not, it, the, the variables are actually at every level. So if you load X, it'll be in RAM, it'll be in L3, it'll be in L2, it'll be in L1, and it'll be in registers. And then as it gets evicted, it's just being erased from the lower levels, but it's still in the higher levels. It doesn't, there's no, process most of the time to kick them out although they have they have done it that way before okay 
So let's go and make some code. Um, all right, let's make, oh, I deleted all my data as well, so yeah, oops, no. Let's go back and delete data. For some reason, the, these things weren't working. Uh, global main. It happens when you update your system. I don't know, Vim syntax highlighting is broken, it looks like. Okay, so I'm using NVim. I don't know if you guys have ever seen NeoVim before, NVim. It is a uh, parallel effort to Vim. And um, it's uh, mostly the same thing. The only difference you'll notice is at the very bottom here, there's this like, uh, I don't know, status bar, I guess you call it. If you go into insert mode, you know, you can see it's in colors and things like that. In Vim's a little bit nicer than Vim. I've been having issues with it where it would just start beeping at me for no reason. Like beep, beep, and I'm like, I'm not even doing anything, dude. And so I found that really annoying. Even with like, a, a, you know, turning every option to beep off, it would still beep at me. Ignore bells and all that stuff. And so I don't know what the hell has gone off it, but. I'll roll with it for now because it's got pretty colors. It's telling you to program. <laughs> okay, uh, and don't apologize for asking questions. When you, I like it when students ask questions, and, and, and I'm not being short with you. They're good questions. I I, I just want to get to the um, assembly so you guys can get, do the homework. <laughs> okay, so let's say um, so let's say we are going to print. Let's say we want to print hello world. Let's say we want to print hello world a hundred times, or that's too many times. Let's say 10 times. Okay. So how do we, how do we do that in assembly? How do we do that in assembly? So, you know, basically it, uh, what, we're, what we're trying to do is for, you know, and I equals zero, I is less than 10, I plus plus, see out, hello world. So, all right, let's do it in C, print F. Hello world. And so that's uh, for those of you that have never programmed in C before. Uh, that's how you print something to the screen. It's called print function printf, and it just writes things to the standard output. Okay. And so let's let's do this code in assembly. Okay. You guys ready for this? Uh, or maybe uh, yeah. Let's start with this. This is simple enough. Okay. So. Let's uh, let's start off by just writing a for loop, and then after we verify the for loop works, then I'll show you guys how to how to print something. Okay, you guys good? You guys understand what's going on here? Cool. All right. So basically, when I the way that I teach learning to assemble, write assembly, is I just show you C plus plus code. I'm like, all right, now here's how you do this in assembly, and then. Once you kind of understand, like, okay, that's how it works, then the fun of assembly begins, where you get to do code golf, right? And you get to like sit there and play with things, be like, ah, oh, I could, I could optimize this, and that's what assembly is all about. Assembly is not about uh, ease of use. Assembly is not about being able to quickly, you know, hack up a program. That is the opposite of assembly. Assembly, if you wrote everything in assembly, you would have a gray hair by the time you finished, right? Uh, you know, try writing World of Warcraft in assembly, you know. But what's fun about assembly is you can sit there and you can tweak things and and optimize them. And um, uh, sometimes you can beat the compiler. So you can you can oftentimes do things faster than the C++ compiler will do them. Sometimes you won't. C++ compiler is very smart. GC, G++, GCC, and Clang have amazing optimizers. They're really, really good. Even still, um, it's a fun exercise we do every year where I have you guys beat the optimizer, write code that is faster than what the optimizer can do. You know, And sometimes you can do that by cheating. Like if you know things that the optimizer can't know, like this number will never be bigger than you know 256, then you don't have to, you know, like if you know things that the compiler can't know, then a lot of times you can, you can beat it on performance. Okay, <clears throat> assembly is for min-maxers. Yeah, yeah, and it's fun. It's a, it's a fun like mental exercise too. And more importantly, you're learning how CPUs work. 
that's really the point of this uh, class is that um, is you learn how CPUs work. And but if you need to, you can optimize. League of Legends they they rewrote their particle code, which was their slowest part of the game. They rewrote it a bunch of times, and they eventually rewrote it. The hottest loop they had, the thing, the most inner innermost loop of the innermost loops that gets called you know fifty thousand times a second. They rewrote that in assembly, and they got a noticeable speed increase. Like it, like on, on busy combat screens, it gave like a, I don't know what it was, like maybe a 10 frames per second speed up. And so people still do it today. Okay. So what should we do first? League, they rerun an assembly, makes sense. Yeah. Uh, might be why Wine has trouble with it. I don't know. Okay. So, so what's the first thing we need to do? What should we do? We got, uh, we got this variable here called I. What should we do with I first? make it you can't make variables in assembly what are you talking about there's just registers store it in r0 Ooh, bold move cotton let's see how that works out okay let's do that i like crashing and burning all right so we're uh we're gonna call r0 r0 is i all right let's do this I should probably alias it whatever i don't care all right so uh, store it in R15. <laughs> sure. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Let's do this. Let's do this. This will be amazing. Okay. Compiled. Oh, it crashed. Oh. <laughs> there you go. Okay. So, uh, it was, it was a learning experience, right? It's a learning experience. Okay. So R0 is I. And uh, there, there, there are ways you can alias it. It's a little bit more readable, but I, I typically just do it like this. I just make a note. What happened to my syntax highlighting? Oh, end There we go. All right. Um, alias vv to last end Nope. Uh, shoot. And Vim is NeoVim. It's a, it's a rewriting of Vim from scratch, basically. It's got a better plugin system that works a little bit nicer. Um, uh, the, the only difference you'll notice is it's got the status bar down here. That's, you know, for, for all intents and purposes, you will not notice any difference from NVim. But for some reason, when Vim's syntax highlighting starts barfing, I, I, I don't know why, I'm gonna have to dig into it. I just switched to NeoVim. NeoVim seems to be more, uh, does NVim use VimRC as well? It can. It doesn't by default, but if you put into your NeoVimRC, uh, there, you, you can Google how to do this. It can it can use your VimRC. And then whatever changes you make in your VimRC get propagated to both of them. So, good question, good question. File type plugin on, syntax on, set, I don't know why. I mean, it was working last time. Right? Like it was literally working a second ago. Uh, Syntax is not on. Yeah, syntax is on. So, I don't know what to tell you. I mean, it just literally stopped working right now. Okay. So uh, now what do we do? So we've got like this part done. And so I think the next thing we need to do, because in a, in a for loop, the first thing you do is actually the, the if statement, right? So we do a for loop. It first initializes the variable. Then it immediately does the if statement. So if you were to set int i equal to 100, it would it would skip the loop entirely, right? So how do we do how do we do an if statement in assembly, ARM32 assembly? Compare, compare, compare. All right. So what am I comparing? What am I comparing? In my for loop here. If your Vim syntax highlighting works, you can continue using Vim. Yeah, you can, yeah, of course. Um, I'm only switching to Neo Vim because I don't know Vim just started barfing on me. Um, they're for all intents and purposes, they're the same. You'll, you'll notice differences if you start impl installing plugins and things like that, but um, you know, for basic use, they're, they're identical. Okay, we've got a couple different options out there. So one person said, compare R0 with a less than or equal to 10, which I don't think will work. Uh, compare R0 with a register that holds 10, uh, compare it less than 10. 
Um, how about we just compare it with 10? Like that. So this will do all six, com all six comparisons. It will do i is less than, equal to, greater than 10. And this is actually valid C++ code now. Spaceship operator. It's really cool because it actually maps to the assembly actually kind of well. So um, it will do is i less than 10, is i greater than 10, is i equal to 10, is i not equal to 10. So less than or equal to, greater than or equal to does all of them, does all the comparisons at once for um, this, you know, the same cost. Okay. And so when do we, let's, let's jump down here. Let's make a label called done. And all we're going to do in done is quit. Okay. So, because uh, there's nothing else in our program, right? So when do we quit? When do we quit? I has to be what in order for us to quit? Why would you do that instead of saying if I? If I means if I is not zero. In this case, we want to know if I is less than 10. When i is equal to ten, well, what if what if i started off higher than ten, right? What if what if we had initialized i to be hundred? We want to catch that as well, right? One one really important thing that um, uh, I, I want is for my code to be very robust. I don't like my code breaking if something unexpected happens, and so rather than using like equals ten, I typically use if it's greater than or equal to ten, then uh, branch if greater than or equal to to done. And so that way, if somebody comes in here and changes that to 20, my code won't infinitely loop. I like having code that will handle every circumstance. It's something that I, I try to instill in my students for years, right? Uh, yeah, no, I, I got you, Dolly. I, I'm, not, I'm not criticizing you. It's just a general philosophical point that I'm making, which is that um, I want my code to not um, break if something un unexpected happens. I want my code to handle all, all possibilities. It's, it's a philosophy called defensive coding. Um, but I mean, the cost here is the same, right? If you write down branch of greater than or equal to, or if you write down branch of equal to, the cost is the same, but this will work in more circumstances, right? Branch of greater than or equal to will work in all circumstances. So, uh, yeah, no, it's, it's all good. It's all good. Greater than nine. Yeah. Greater than nine would also work. Um, I would probably do, um, 10 just because that expresses intent more clearly. So 10 is our target. So I want 10 in there. Just philosophical though, that makes no difference. Okay, so move zero into I, compare R is zero. Oh, we need the top of the loop here, okay. So that's the top of the loop. And then, and then do we immediately add one to it? Or do we do this first? Do we do the printf first, or do we add one to register zero first? Which one do we do? Doesn't matter. Oh, let's say conceptually, like in C plus plus, which takes place first, or C. What takes place first? Does the printf take place first, or does the I plus plus take place first? Yeah, the printf. The printf takes place first. And so the I plus plus, the I plus plus takes place at the very bottom of the loop, right? So the I plus plus is the very last thing that happens at the bottom of the loop. And then it jumps up to the top of the loop and does this. And if you guys didn't know that before, it's because uh, it's probably my fault for not explaining it very well, but this happens before the loop. This happens at the top of every loop and this happens at the bottom of every loop. And you can put anything in there. They don't have to be. They don't have to follow the format, but you should follow the format. Okay. So now we need to do the printf. Okay. <clears throat> um, let's let's do the I plus plus first. Okay. So add R zero R zero one, and let's see how this works out. Let's just compile this code. There we go. So you can see that R0 was indeed 10 when the program quit. So that loop ran 10 times. So we know, congratulations, our loop is correct. Or is it? I don't know. Let's find out. I'm so used to doing plus plus I. Yeah, that's fine. That's that's the more correct way. The more correct way of doing um, loops is plus plus I rather than I plus plus. 
Um, it doesn't matter. Look, it's, it's, it's the same assembly either way. Okay. Uh, why is it more correct? Because when you do I++, plus plus, it makes it temporary. So like if you do something like X is equal to I++, plus plus, like if, if you wrote if you wrote this code in C++, if you wrote X is equal to I++, plus plus, then what it does is it copies the value of I into X, but it has to make a copy of I's value. Uh, is that true? No. For pointers, for like iterators and things like that, um, I++ plus plus can generate a temp because it has to both it has to have both values. It has to have the original value and it has to have the new value. And so it has to do a copy every time when you're doing things with like iterators and things like that. And so it's better to use plus plus with the iterator instead of I plus plus um, because it's, it's faster. Uh, for, for things like this, um, it might have to use another register. But the reality of the situation is, the reality of the situation is that if you plug this into Godbolt, uh, you probably won't see any difference in code if you use plus plus or I plus plus. But people just get into the, the habit of using plus plus all the time because um, in, there are circumstances where it is faster. At the same time, the optimizer will also probably delete all of those circumstances. So most part, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Okay. So yeah, so this could work. So how do we call printf? How do we call a function? Okay. So uh, we've got a loop. This is a for loop. This is the format you guys are going to use for all of your for loops. For your next homework assignment, you're going to write a for loop. Okay. How, uh, do you have any questions, first of all, about the for loop before we get into how to call a function? Any, any, uh, any questions? What's going on here? This is, this is how it's done. This is how you do a for loop. This is an if statement here. That's how you do an if statement. And then this is how you do a for loop. Uh, the only thing, uh, so if you have multiple for loops, don't call all of them top, right? A label can only appear one time in your code. So um, if you ever look at the generated assembly, it, it, it's all just like label zero, label one, label two, label three, label four. So they don't reuse, um, they don't reuse labels. Top one, top two, top three, yeah. yeah. So uh, what's the key bind to uppercase uh, in Vim? It's tilde. If you tilde, it will change the case of a letter. And so if you go like five tilde, it flips the, the case on five letters. Um, you know, any questions about this? Straightforward? You could write a for loop yourself. I mean, this is, this is the, maybe, You'll find out. <laughs> You'll find out. Okay, so how do we call printf? This is this is a big, big question, right? Because if you can call printf, now your code can actually do things, right? Because right now, the only thing we can do is like uh, check the re the return code, right? Which is not uh, essential. <laughs> it's not very useful. It's not very user friendly. Hey, run Excel, and then after Excel quits, check the error code, and that'll have your tax. <laughs> How much you owe in taxes? You know, no, like, you know, what is that? You know, nobody writes code that way. So how do you, how do you call a function? So how you call a function is by using uh, BL. So does anyone here know what BL stands for? And I'm not talking about like a fan fiction BL. Uh, BL stands for uh, branch bacon, lettuce, and tomato. Very good. Uh, uh, BL stands for branch with link. And what that means is um, branch with link. Uh, this means function call. Okay. So branches are used. Branches, i.e. B, are used to jump around in your own code. BL is used to call a function, like a real function. Okay, that's the, that's the rule of thumb. So you see how we're using B here, right? Do you guys see the difference? BL versus B. 
Um, a lot of students get British Airways BAL confused with BL because they look very similar and they're not the same. They're not the same. They're not the same. If you want a branch of the link always, it'd be Bilal. That means branch of link always. So <laughs> nobody writes that though. Nobody writes that. Uh, you could write Bilal and just B if you really want to keep them separate in your head. Uh, it looks like garbage to me though. So um, this would be acceptable as well. I, I think this would actually look acceptable to me. Um, and if you if you write code this way, then you're not then maybe you're less likely to confuse these two. But these these two things are very different. Your code will crash. Your code will crash. Your code will crash. Your code will crash if you get them mixed up. Your code will crash. So don't mix them up. So function call. Okay. And then this is just to jump to a label. Okay. You guys with me? So this is going to call a function called print hello. Where is print hello located? I don't know. I haven't written it yet. Uh, the reason why I'm not actually writing hello world, I'm actually going to call um, this function is because we haven't learned how to load things from memory yet. And so rather than actually writing our own, um, you know, version of this with the call to put, put string that we saw earlier, the way that the compiler did it, what we're going to do instead is I'm going to write this in C. Your code will crash. Yes. So I'm going to write this function print hello in C. And you'll see me use this in a lot of programming assignments just because it's a lot easier to do things with strings and printing in C than it is in assembly because strings suck. They're super annoying. They're super duper annoying to deal with. They're super annoying to deal with in C as well, but they're less annoying than in, C and than in assembly. Okay. So I'm going to show you guys how you can combine, um, Assembly in C. Are you guys ready for this? It's like the Wonder Twins. All right. All right. So they're going to combine the powers of C and assembly. Okay. All right. So I'm going to make a program. I'm going to not make a program. I'm just going to make um, a, a C file that has one function in it called print hello.c. And this is going to be a void function print hello. And all it's going to do is printf. Hello world. And I don't have syntax highlighting again because Vim is acting weird. And we need to include standard io.h. Standard io.h is the C version of io streams, basically. And so that's it. <laughs> Notice there's no main. Do you guys see that? There's no main. No main. This isn't a program. This is just code. This is C code containing a function, one function. It's not a complete program, it's a function. Okay. Your CSI 40 teacher taught us strings in C++ as if they were C style string shutters. Yeah, so did I in the mid 90s. <clears throat> I spent half of my time in 40 and 41 doing nothing but learning strings because they're that annoying and they're that garbage to work with. They're super annoying and super garbage to work with. And the C++ string class in and of itself is enough reason to migrate to C++ because strings are so garbage. Everybody screws them up. Everybody goes one too far, one not far enough, and we'll learn about them later. But like, okay, so you guys with me on this? We got, we got this little boy here. It's just a simple function, right? And we're going to have our assembly call the C function. Okay. You guys ready for this? So now are you going to use the optimizer? Nah, no optimizer. I am the optimizer. Look at me. I'm the optimizer now. Okay. Okay. You ready? All right. So there's, there's our C code. Here, I'll show you the C code again. It's just one function. Prints hello world to the screen. Let's look at our assembly. Our assembly code is going to 10 times call print hello. Are you guys ready to see how you combine them? Ready? You hyped? All right. GCC loop dot S hello dot C. 
That's it. Oh, what I call it? Uh, print hello. Sorry, that was anticlimactic. Print hello. .c. There we go. And that's it. We have now combined them together. So our assembly code is now calling the code in print hello. And so if you look at uh, if you look at what symbols are inside of the a dot out, the symbols are the labels essentially that are present in the executable. You can see there's a ton of crap in there, right? You know, and abort and like all this stuff. And it's from the GNU C library. That's because we're, we're doing a printf. And so you can see in here, we've got main, we got a call to print hello, and all the rest of the stuff basically comes done. There's done, top is in there, there you go. Um, all the rest of that stuff though is from the libc library, right? You'll probably see puts in there. Yeah, there's puts right there. Um, yeah, so, so we brought in a lot of stuff invisibly, right? but uh, can assembly use a CPP file? That's a story for another time. Uh, you can if you use extra in C, is the short. If you want to actually call a C++ function from assembly, that's a lecture for another time. Um, yeah, I don't want to get into it now. We have half an hour left. Okay. Can you show the function one more time? Sure. So the this is the C function. All the C function does is it calls printf. Printf just prints to the screen. It's going to print to the screen, hello world, with a new line. That's it. And then the assembly code is going to do the loop. .s. Okay. The assembly code is 10 times going to call print hello. Or will it? Remember, Muya made the choice of uh, using register zero. Let's see if that works out. Segfault. Hello world, segfault. Hmm. 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 It, it, could, it could infinite loop for you as well. The reason for that is because R0 is not preserved through function calls. If you do a branch with link, R0, for all intents and purposes, is set to a random number. Okay? R0 is now set to a random number. Let's just put it that way. Every time you call branch with link, R0 gets wiped. Okay? So, um, yeah, it could run forever. It might crash. Who knows? Okay? And uh, let's see if there's anything else we need to do. Yes, we need to do the push and pops. Okay. So it, it is... <laughs> It is R zero is an input register, but we're not passing we're not passing it to print hello. Remember print hello, um, print hello takes takes no variables, All right? So, um, so let's change this to register four. Register four is going to be preserved by print hello, and there's still probably going to be a crash, but this is the more proper way of doing it. Okay. And there we go. So it, it runs one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten times. Then it crashes. Then it crashes. But look, the loop worked. In, uh, in some of your guys' homework assignments, your, your code is actually passing all test cases, but also crashing after, um, <laughs> after you'd successfully printed everything out. Fortunately, segfault gets run to C error, I believe, instead of C out. Why does it say fault after? Great question. So the reason why it's crashing afterwards is because we're not preserving the registers ourselves. So there, uh, you know how I said like registers four through 11 are preserved by functions? That doesn't take place automatically. You have to do that yourself manually. So when somebody calls a function that you have, you must preserve registers four through 11 and the link register. The reason for that the link register, register 14, register 14. What is, what is register 14? Register 14, BL, that's what BL does, by the way. BL sets register 14 to be the address of the uh, return place. So when, when BL print hello calls, when it calls that function, it sets register 14 to be the address here. So when 
when this guy when this guy returns, it knows where to return to. Do you guys understand? When you do a function call, you need to you. It's not a go to. It's a you know because if it's just a go to, you go there and you have no way of getting back. So when you do a function call, when you do a function call, the link register, which is R14, gets set. And then when you return, you return to that address. Okay. And so when you call a branch with linked print hello, the link register is set to the memory address of that instruction right there. And so when print hello returns, it returns back to here. It adds one to R4, it jumps up, it calls print hello again. When print hello finishes all of its stuff, it returns to here and it continues running and it does that 10 times. Then we return to whatever value is in the link register. But we didn't save what was in R14. We didn't save what was in R14. We didn't save it. And so whatever was in R14 is probably um, garbage or it's probably not garbage. It's probably, what would it be? Uh, maybe, maybe this or something like that. Yeah, it, it's, it, we didn't save it. And so because we did a function call and we didn't save link register, um, oops, oops. So what do we do? What's the proper way? I'm not using R0 anymore. I'm using R4. So BX R4, you could, you, you probably could let's see if that would work. Actually, let's see, uh, move into register five from register 14. So it probably work, right? Branch with link, uh, branch exchange to R5. Would that work? I've never done that before. It's so horrible, but let's, let's do that. Why not? I, I, I love, I love this class because you can just experiment and find out if your code dies. Nope. It worked fine. Okay, cool. Uh, that's not normal. <laughs> that's, that's not the normal. That's not the normal way of doing it, but um, that is probably good from an informative um, and educational perspective, right? Register 14 has the return address for main, okay? Register 14 has the return address for main. Main is actually not the beginning of your program. Main is called by something called start. Uh, start sets up all of your constructors and globals and things like that. Um, then start calls main. And so main needs to return back into start and what was happening was that R14 was not being restored properly. And so um, it was crashing, right? And so this, I mean, that was a good solution. I, mean, I like that. So we're just saving R14 into R5 and then we're just gonna return whatever values in R5. That works apparently just fine. Um, if, it, if it's bad and it works, is it really bad? Yeah, it, well, it eats up a register it is what's bad. You know, you've only got eight registers to play with and you don't wanna have to waste one of them to store what is actually in R14. Like you already got a register for that. And so let me show you the proper way of doing it. And you're gonna do this every time you do a function call, basically. Uh, example seven. Uh, why are you doing this to me? And then, so if you guys check on the awesome demos folder, look, look, syntax highlighting, it's amazing. Okay. So every time you do a function call, like a real function, if you're making a function, you're going to do basically this is what you're going to do. So you save the link register onto the stack. Uh, the stack is an area of memory that as, as you call functions, they call functions, call functions. The stack grows downwards in memory and it's, and it's basically saving the return addresses and, and it's saving the state of the registers of the other function calls. So you save the state of the link register, you save the state of the of the, of the variables you're supposed to preserve, you do your business, and then you pop them back off the stack. So you push them onto the stack, and you pop them off the stack. And uh, the reason why this is fast is because you can write to the stack very quickly because the uh, the memory subsystem, even though it takes a few cycles to, to finish, um, it'll go in right into L1 cache. And then when you pop these, they'll come right off of L1 cache. So it's not fast. It's not fast, but it's fast. It's fast enough, I guess. Yep. Who's hogging the server power? I checked top, no one is, very confused. It's probably the streaming, honestly. It's probably the streaming. Um, you can write macros, we'll talk about that more later. Uh, anyhow, so what you're supposed to do when you call main, and the reason why a lot of your code was seg faulting, and, and every time you call a function, you should do these two lines. So this pushes the link register, uh, register 14, it pushes that onto the stack. 
And then you're supposed to save registers four through 11. Push those onto the stack as well. And then uh, at the very end, at the very end, you pop them back off and you see how they're in reverse order because it's a stack. Uh, you push the link register and then you push four through 11. Then you pop off four through 11, you pop off the link register. But when you pop the link register, you don't pop it, uh, you know, just into the link register. You actually pop it into the program counter. And so what that does is it moves it moves the return address in register 14 into register 15. Register 15 is the next line of code to run. And so by moving the link register into the, the program counter, it jumps to that, that location. So this is, this is how you return from a function properly. This is the proper way of returning from a function. Okay. Uh, it just takes a little bit more code, so I don't show it right off the bat. Okay, so. Let's go ahead and do that. So vim, uh, what was it called, loop.s. Uh, and then at the very bottom, so rather than this branch of link thing, not need to do this anymore. And this is our final form. Okay. You guys with me? So this is uh, this is our program. Okay. So you know how I said registers four through eleven are saved? You have to save them. <laughs> you have to save them. Um but if you want to optimize it, if you want to optimize it a little bit, you don't have to save all of them, right? Look, I'm only using register four. You guys see that? So if I really wanted to optimize it, I could just do that if I wanted. But um, let's not worry about that for now. This is how you start a function. That's how you start a function. That's how you finish a function. Okay? You guys with me? Now you know functions. <laughs> Now you know functions. You know everything there is to know about a function, basically. All the important bits. How do you start a function? How do you end a function? Uh, registers 0 through 4 get passed in. Register 0 gets passed out. That's all you need. You can write functions now. Okay? And there we go. That's it. So uh, assembly and C go together like peanut butter and jelly, like chocolate and peanut butter. They go together really, really nicely. Or peanut butter and bananas. Or peanut butter and Aussie bowls. Or almond butter and Aussie bowls, even better. So um, does BXLR pass LR to PC? Yes. So uh, the way that I had it returning the code before was this, right? BXLR. And so what that does is it, it branches to whatever address is in the link register, right? And so that moves, another way you could do this is um, move PC LR. That's another way of doing it. Just copy the return, copy the return address, copy register 14 into register 15. PC is the uh, program counter, register 15. And that's just, again, that's, the register 15 holds the memory address of the next line of code to run. And so you do it manually that way. Nobody ever writes it that way. Everybody writes the code this way. So at the start of your function, you save the registers that need to be saved. You do your business. And at the end, you restore them. And that's how you do a function. You save registers 4 through 11. You save their link register. And then after all your business is done, you restore registers 4 through 11. And you restore the link register into the program counter. And that's how you function. You, you, there's lots of ways you can do it, um, but this is just the standard, the standard way of writing a function. Is this kind of like a void function? What is? What is like a, a void function? Is 
is also push and pop into RAM. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. The um, uh, that's that's why you know, when, like I said, you can optimize it. Um, you can optimize that a lot because RAM is slow, but it goes right into cache. All these values here get thrown right into L1 cache, and when you pop them, they're probably still going to be on L1 cache. And so it's it's a penalty, but it's not as big a penalty as you think. And um, this is this will generate um, a multiple move command. I think that should be relatively fast. It's not it's not like free by any means, but. Um, It's not free, it's expensive, but it's not, it's not like RAM expensive. It's not like 200 cycles, but there is an overhead to, you, to function calls. And that's why, that's why if you can avoid function calls, you get a lot of speed. And that's why in C++ there's the inline, the inline keyword. The inline keyword is there to tell the compiler not to make a function, but to take the, the code of your function and copy it into the other function. And again, that's a lecture for another time. Uh, so push LR is first followed by R4 or 11 and at the bottom you guys see how it's inverted it's because it's a stack you put the link register on the stack and then you put well it's actually decreasing so you put the link register on the stack and then you put R4 through R11 on the stack and then when you're done you pop it off the stack and pop it off the stack so stacks are first and last out last and first out all right, so we, uh, woo, I don't know what's going on here. Uh, I, oh, you're editing your .o file. Yeah, yeah good luck. Uh, good luck. It, it, don't, I mean, here, gcc-c print hello.c. So if you want to look at a .o file, a .o file is a object file. Um, there, there you go. There's kind of no point in looking at it. If, because this is this is like assembly, right? And so Vim's like trying to parse assembly, and it's not coming up with anything. Uh, occasionally, you'll see words in there, and that's because there are strings inside of it. Uh, there's pretty much no reason to ever Vim it. Uh, Elf, by the way, um, is uh, the executable loading format. That's the file format of the .o file. Um, yeah, there's really no reason to Vim Vim it. If, if you're actually interested in that kind of stuff, then Hex dump is the way to go. So you can hex dump print hello dot o. So there's what it looks like in hex if you're into that kind of stuff. I'm not. Uh, but a more useful thing is string or strings. Yeah, print hello dot o. And so strings is a um, is probably what you're trying to do, Muya. I don't know. But it, it just goes through that dot o file and it looks for any uh, words in it. Yep. So that's all the words that are in print hello. It's very useful when you're decompiling stuff. And you're looking for like secret passwords and things like that. Okay. Uh, NM is also useful. Uh, that shows all the different symbols that are in that auto file. Um, in this case, it has defined print hello, and it makes a call to put s. So this auto file here exports one symbol. Uh, a symbol is a label that you can call. So it says, "I'm I'm print hello. Nice to meet you." And it makes a call to put s. And so the linker, has, it's like puzzle pieces, right? The linker, when you uh, gcc dash c loop dot s, if you nm loop dot s, uh, loop dot o, sorry, you can see that, put up top of the screen for you guys, uh, you can see that loop dot o has defined main. These are private labels that shouldn't be called by other people. Uh, but it is defined and exported the symbol main, and it's making a call, an undefined symbol to print hello. Print hello defines print hello and has an undefined call to put s. Okay, and so when you run, when you finally compile the thing and all the .o files come together, that, that's the linking step. And the linking step says, okay, well, this person uh, is calling print hello, and this person has print hello, but that person also calls. It's this and so it, it starts assembling you know all the different pieces and if there's anything that's missing like if I just tried compiling uh, loop.o by itself then it'll say um, there's an undefined reference to print hello I could not find that missing puzzle piece 
I'm trying to build an executable and there's a giant piece missing here. And, uh, and the reason why it work, it doesn't work with, with that, but it does work with this is because the linker finds put s in the standard library. And, um, and so it marks it as being part of the dynamic library. Um, and we'll worry more about that later. Okay, so uh, does that, do you guys kind of understand a little bit more about linkers now? I don't want to do a full lecture on it, but that's kind of what's going on behind the scenes when you have different pieces of a program like that. Do you guys kind of understand? Like loop.s has main defined and it calls print hello. That's why it's undefined there. Print hello defines print hello and calls put s. And so the linker says, okay, this guy's calling this guy. Oh, but this guy needs this guy. And I'm still a little confused with the pop and push. The main takeaway is that these four pieces of code for loops. So uh, push and pop, um, uh, just always do it. Let's, let's put it that way. Every time you have a function, start the function with global, like an actual function, not like, not like something like this, but like an actual function. These four lines will start your function. Let's just put it that way. These four lines start your function. If the name of your function is print hello, it'd be global print hello, print hello colon, those two lines there. You do whatever it is your, your code's going to do, and then it will end with those two lines. You guys understand? So that's how you do a function. So functions, functions start with these four lines. Functions end with these two lines. Okay, that's all you need to know. And how how they work, we can talk more about later. We got ten minutes left, so let's get into the homework. What are you doing with R four and R eleven? And you're saving them. You're saving them to RAM because you're going to mess with them, right? Like I said, R four I said R four to zero there. It's against the law, the AAP CS. It's against the law to change some other functions R four through R eleven. So it's your responsibility to save them to RAM and then you can mess with them however you want. And then before you go back, you have to put it back the way you left it, right? So that other function had nine in R4. You save nine to RAM, you do your thing. I, I you know, you're messing with R4 and when you're done, you put, you put nine back. You so see, you put everything back the way it was. It's like you throw a party at your parents' house, you have a wild party, but then, you know, before they come back from out of town, you put everything back the way it was before and none's the wiser. Uh, storing, writing, read, write. Okay, yeah, so this part here saves those registers that need to be saved. It saves them to RAM, and this part restores them the way they were before. Okay, okay so let's talk about the homework assignment. So, CD ASM FizzBuzz. So, FizzBuzz is a classic uh, chmod, chmod. Why are you all executable? You should not be executable. Star. Make clean, make okay, better. Okay, so FizzBuzz is a classic, classic job interview problem. Okay, and so FizzBuzz is used as a screening tool. It's probably one of the most common job interview questions, uh, coding coding problems ever. So getting experience using assembly, uh, uh, FizzBuzz is useful. Assembly FizzBuzz maybe not as useful, but uh, let me show you what it looks like when it works. Make pain. Make. Really? I don't copy. I don't use make files. What is this? Oh, it's Asim Fizzbuzz. Sorry. Yeah, whatever. Okay. So. Oh. oh, I was in the wrong directory. Make clean. Make. And then this is what your code should print out. Okay. So your code should print out 1, 2, Fizz, 4, Buzz, Fizz, 7, 8, Fizz, Buzz, 11, Fizz. So what are the rules? The rules for FizzBuzz are this. Uh, you print the numbers from 1 to 100, not 0 to 99, 1 to 100. You print the numbers from 1 to 100, and anytime a number is divisible by 3, 
you print fizz. Anytime a number is divisible by five, you print buzz. If it's divisible by both three and five, like fizz buzz is, then you print fizz buzz. That's it. That's your assignment. You guys got a week to do this. Okay. And, uh, and you will be code golfed on this. So you will gain extra credit if you are in the top 25% of students again. So um, if you simply can produce this, don't write it in C++. Um, if you guys submit code in C++ to do this, it's a zero. You have to do it in assembly. Uh, you, you can't use um, you know the compiler to generate the assembly for you. Compiler generated assembly is cheating. You, you're, you're, you're welcome to do it to look at the assembly, like to see how the compiler did something, but you can't use it like you can't just copy and paste it into your own code. Um, it is useful to like remember like what was that command again? Branch of link? What is that? You know. Uh, so it's it's almost like a, a interactive uh, uh, man page, right? Having the compiler generate assembly for you so you can look at it, but don't copy and paste it. It's blatantly obvious when students do that, so don't do it. Um, yeah. So you have a week to to do that. Um, you might be wondering. Wait a second. There's no modulus. That is correct. There is no modulus in assembly. So you've got to write fizzbuzz without a modulus command. Okay. If you make a function call, uh, function calls are, um, see, how do we code call this exactly? Uh, yeah, just, we'll just add up the cost of every line in your, in your, uh, your code. Um, you have to use my built-in um, print functions. So type, there we go. So C. So, so these are the functions you have to call. Okay. So there is print fizz, which will print fizz to the screen. There's print buzz, which will print buzz to the screen. Print fizz buzz. You can't circumvent these, and I'm not going to score them against you. So the the calls to these print functions are free. Um, so don't worry about the cost of those, uh, but you can't, you can't write your own anyway. Like just branch with link to print fizz and that will print fizz to the screen. Okay. What if you make a modulus command? If you make a modulus command, then that's part of your code golf, right? I'll just tell you right now, you don't need modules to do this. It really sounds like you do, but you don't. And so I'll, I'll let you guys try and figure out how to do fizz buzz without a modules command in assembly. Um, if you if you write your own modulus function, you're probably going to blow the code golf budget out of the water. Okay. And so all the dot all, all the dot c program does is it calls your function. Your function is called fizzbuzz, and then if it comes back successfully, then it prints that. And so if it seg faults between here and there, that means you're not preserving the registers properly or something like that. And that's that's all of the C code. So the C code just has these little these little print functions that'll do the printing for you. It'll print fizz, buzz, fizz, buzz, or the number. These are the tools in your toolbox. And then your assembly code is gonna be inside of a function called fizz, buzz. And you're just gonna print the numbers from one to 100 with numbers divisible by three, fizz, numbers divisible by five, buzz, numbers divisible by 15, fizz, buzz. Okay. Logical shift left, nope. LSL will not help you do modules. Let me not show you my answer. Let me show you the starter code. The starter code is does.s. Alias vim and vim. There we go. Okay. Um, yeah. So that's how you start a function, remember? That's how you start a function. And that's how you end a function. Yep. Uh, if you ever need to terminate your program, this calls exit. That's how you call exit, by the way. So that's a software interrupt that'll actually do a system call. Don't worry about it. You shouldn't need it. Um, but that if you need to just like quit your program, that's how you do it. All right. So yeah, you guys understand? That's your. Uh, that's your assignment, you got a week to do it.
don't modify, don't modify, don't modify. Just leave those alone. They don't count against your code golf. Okay. Your your stuff is you're going to be code golfed on everything in between. Okay. Every time you log on the CSI Forex server, it's saying system restart is required. Um, yeah, it it needs to be rebooted. That's true. Okay, that's it for today, guys. Um, yeah, I, I I'm just waiting for nobody to be on the server so I can reboot it without hurting people's homework. Okay. I've muted you. You're muted. Hello? 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 Mike muted. Am I? Hello? 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 How much of that did you guys miss? I didn't change anything. I don't know what happened. All of it? What do you mean all of it? You need me to explain FizzBuzz over or like... Um, yeah, anyhow. So the... Uh, um, leave that alone. That won't, that won't be counted for the code golf. That doesn't get counted for code golf. The stuff you're going to get code golfed on is the part in the middle. Okay. Last five minutes. Okay. Well, anyhow, um, that's your homework assignment. You have to do fizz buzz. The, uh, you don't need modules to do it. You don't need modules to do it. You can do it without modulus. Um, just, you're going to write code here that will print the numbers from one to a hundred. All numbers divisible by three are fizz. All numbers divisible by five are, uh, Buzz, every number divisible by 15 is fizz buzz. Okay. Dower, do you understand the homework limit? I don't know how much you missed. Um, Main.c has the functions you're going to call. So if you wanted to call print fizz, what would you guys type? Like if you wanted to have your assembly code, if you wanted to have your assembly code print fizz to the screen, what would you guys write in assembly to print fizz to the screen? And what would happen if you had register zero holding a value when you called print fizz? And the answer is indeed BL print fizz, right? So if you wanted to call this, um, if you wanted to call this from assembly, to call this from assembly, write BL print fizz. When you call this from assembly, registers R0 through R3 get white. Okay. There's no guarantee they'll still be there. So do not use anything important R0 through R3 because they get destroyed every time you do a function call. Okay. If you, yeah, just use registers 4 through 11. That's plenty for this assignment. If you need more, yeah, you can use push and pop, but you shouldn't need to. Okay. I'm not sharing screen. Yeah. Your screen, screen two, there. Okay, so uh, void print fizz. Okay, so in order to call print fizz, you call BL print fizz, and then it wipes registers zero through three. It's not a tough homework assignment. The only tricky bit is trying to figure out how do I how do I do modulus without modulus? How do I get fizz and buzz to print at the right times? What you guys think about that? My ears are back, but they took my eyes. <laughs> I should be streaming now. Yeah. Okay. Any other any other questions about the homework assignment? Lots of extra credit available in this class. A big, a big part of the fun of this class is that code golfing element to it where you just sit there and try and squeeze it and squeeze it and squeeze it as you know, small as you can. Fun. It's fun for me. Uh, it's, it's a good mental exercise, right? Like, 
you, if, if you just want to get an easy A, just like do the program, call it a day. But uh, it's 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 actually a fun challenge. Like, all right, how can I how can I compress this down a little bit, you know? And uh, push R zero, pop R one. That would move R zero to R one. Yes, it's a very inefficient way. If you if you put if you call push R zero and then you call pop R one, that would move R zero into R one in a very inefficient manner. You should just move it. Uh, in case you CSI forder, I know I know I know it needs a server restart. There, it, it's a message for me. I just I updated the server. I I need to reboot it. It's not a big deal. I'm just waiting for students to not be on the server so I don't destroy their homework. CSI forty people don't know how to use the Vim scratch files or anything. All right, that's it. My time's up. See you guys. Hope you had fun today, and we will pick this up again on Thursday. Peace out.